up on Network Africa. Somalia confirms the killing of one of the co-founders of Al-Shabaab as two suicide bombs rip the central Somali town of Bedlewene. Dozens of bodies found in Libya mass graves in the coastal city of Sirte. Plus, Burkina Faso's new military leader, Captain Traore, mandates his cabinet to move faster to fix the country. Hello and welcome to the program. This week, I'm Layo Olaride. We begin in Libya, where the Missing Persons Authority says the unidentified bodies of 42 people have been found in a mass grave in the coastal city of Sirt. The authorities made the discovery at the site of a former school, an area that was controlled by the Islamic State IS group between 2015 and 2016. Another mass grave containing the remains of 34 Ethiopian Christians was also discovered near Sirte in 2018. Though the find comes more than three years after IS Group published a video showing its members executing at least 28 men. In the meantime, a Spanish Coast Guard vessel has transported the bodies of four migrants found in the Atlantic Ocean to the Spanish port of La Palmas de Gran Canaria. The, mi the migrants are thought to have died trying to reach European soil in a dinghy. Local media reports that there was one survivor who said 34 people were making the journey in the dinghy, all of whom died. Well, they're said to be from sub-Saharan Africa and had been traveling in the dinghy for nine days. The dinghy was spotted on Saturday from the Canary Islands by a merchant ship which raised the alarm and rescued the only survivor traveling in the dinghy, while 29 other migrants are still missing. To the Horn of Africa now, Somalia's government says it has killed Abdullahi Nadir, one of the co-founders of the armed group Al-Shabaab, in an operation with international partners. The country's information ministry said in a statement late on Sunday that the operation killed Nadir happened that killed Nadil happened on Saturday. It also says he was Al-Shabaab's chief prosecutor and was in line to replace the group's leader, Ahmed Diriye, who is ill. According to a statement, his death is a thorn removed from the Somali nation and the government says it is grateful to the people and international friends whose cooperation facilitated the killing. Well, in recent weeks, Somali security forces have touted gains made against the Al-Qaeda-linked group while fighting alongside local self-defense groups. But Al-Shabaab has continued to conduct deadly raids, including two last Friday that killed at least 16 people, and another on Monday that police said killed at least five people. In the meantime, two suicide bombs have hit the central Somali town of Bedlewene, causing an unspecified number of casualties. State TV quotes the governor, Ali Jetye, confirming the attacks and adding that there are unspecified casualties and security forces at the scene of the blast are there to conduct an investigation. Well, the TV report did not provide further details and there has been no immediate claim of responsibility for the attacks, but the Al-Shabaab group is known to carry out similar attacks. Well, the latest blast come at a time when government forces and allied clan-based militias are conducting an offensive against Al-Shabaab in Iran region. Let's move to West Africa now. In Burkina Faso, the new military leader, Captain Ibrahim Traore, has met with cabinet ministers and is urging them to move faster to fix the country's urgent problems, including an insurgency by Islamist militants. 
Well, the man he ousted in a coup on Friday, that's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry de Mibbe, has formally agreed to step down, according to religious and community leaders. They say 34-year-old Captain Traore had accepted his resignation and conditions that he had set. Unconfirmed reports now say Lieutenant Colonel de Mibbe has fled to Togo. In the meantime, a delegation from the West African Regional Body ECOWAS is due to arrive in Burkina Faso to try to help restore calm following the country's second coup this year. ECOWAS has called on the new military leadership as led by Captain Traore to respect an earlier agreement to hold elections by July 2024. Well, let's take it back to one of our leading stories, the security situation in Somalia. Joining us now is David Oso, a security analyst, for more on this. Thank you so much for speaking to us on the program. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. Well, what would you say uh, that Somalia has made a significant gain, with, especially with the killing of this Al-Shabaab uh, co-founder? Would you say this is something very significant to the fight against insurgency in the country? Yes. Yes, I think, uh, I think what is important, um, you know, I'm sure that you have, you've, yeah, um, I, I think it's important to, to note that um, uh, Al-Shabaab has been a menace uh, for Somalia for a very long time. Uh, of course, um, decapitating a very significant leader, you know, plays a very powerful role in terms of, you know, the counterinsurgency strategy. But uh, this is a, an insurgency that has several heads. It has a way of um, actually uh, replacing the leaders that it lost, you know, so this is not going to be much of a damage uh, to the strategy and operations of Al-Shabaab. As we have seen, uh, there has been significant attacks, you know, which Al-Shabaab has launched as a matter of counteroffensives. So it's a one good, um, you know, a hit, you know, by the Somalian government, you know, working in line with uh, the, uh, the the U.S. African Special Forces, you know, with some of the local militias and also the Somalian army. But again, it's just one step, you know, towards the right direction. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned the U.S. Africa Com, and that's the U.S. Africa Command, which frequently targets top Al Shabaab militants and positions. But we hit, we're yet to get, you know, comments from the command on this latest development. Should that mean anything? I think what you've got to understand is, you know, when it comes to counterinsurgency, we must give a lot of credit uh, to local forces, even though, uh, as you rightly said, you know, the U.S. plays a very significant role in intelligence, in surveillance, and in terms of, you know, providing, um, you know, some strike force, I think we still have to give a lot of credit to the Somalian National Army, which is at the forefront. And recently, the new president has, you know, um, introduced a strategy that deals with um, uh, including local militias. I mean, just a similar tactics that the Nigerian army used in, in northern part of Nigeria by bringing the civilian joint tax force. So I think it's very critical that in terms of, you know, taking any credit, you know, it should go directly to uh, the local forces. It should go directly to the local militias. Hence, you know, the reason why I think the, U the U.S. is trying to play back uh, its strategic role or if perhaps its tactical role in eliminating such a key leader of Al-Shabaab. And, you, you know, Somali secur security forces in recent weeks, they've, you know, touted gains against Al-Shabaab. But we've had reports from today, you know, two suicide bombs ripping uh, the central town of Ben Well Nien. How can Somalia truly you know, overcome this insurgency? Yes, we've seen a number of attacks in the uh, region of Beladuin, and we've also seen some attacks that have been launched uh, in Hishabela. Mostly uh, these attacks, you know, are vehicle-bound and provide explosive device led. Uh, they're led by suicide bombers. And of course, you know, the sources on ground that I speak to have made it very clear that, you know, these are counter-offensives. Um, of course, you know, perhaps in reaction to uh, the killing of a strategic leader, which often happens uh, in counterinsurgency operations. When a leader is killed, uh, then, of course, you have, you know, some of the forces reacting uh, to that uh, killing. But again, leadership decapitation is one way of, you know, uh, diminishing a group's capacity, you know, to launch attacks. 
But as we know in the history of uh, Al-Shabaab, but also many other uh, international terrorist organizations, simply because you kill the leader doesn't mean it's the end game. I think we need a much more a comprehensive strategy, and I hope that uh, the, the new president you know, has an answer to that. All right then, David Otto, security analyst, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Well, some analysts believe the coup in Burkina Faso on Friday, the second in the country so far this year, was caused by the government's failure uh, in addressing terrorism. Now, this is according to a South African political economist that specializes in conflict and security, Gideon Chitanga. Mr. Chitanga adds that the country needs proactive dialogues to create ways for democratic transition amid increasing division within the military. It looks to me like um, the Damiba uh, junta is dis disintegrating. There are serious internal divisions. Um, on the surface, they look like uh, divisions based on strategy, on uh, issues of how to respond to the issue of uh, festering terrorism in uh, Burkina Faso, particularly in the northern province and the eastern province, and the general uh, state of insecurity. So it, it feels like um, within the military that the current uh, government or the government that has just been removed is failing to address the security situation. But I, I also think that um, the military is increasingly divided. But in general, coups have a way of uh, just generating other coups because they do not provide a better mechanism of, uh, mechanisms of dealing with issues uh, administrative or strategic. move to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where 14 people have been killed by rebels during an attack on a village in the eastern region. Local officials say fighters from the Allied Democratic Forces entered Kiamata in Ituri province late on Saturday, where they killed people using machetes. Well, more than 30 houses were torched and the victims buried in a single grave during a ceremony on Sunday. Well, the people have blamed the attack on a lack of soldiers in the area. The ADF is one of dozens of rebel groups in eastern Congo. Uh, the Ugandan military launched an offensive against the ADF a year ago, or the, the attacks have continued. In the meantime, the head of the UN mission in the DRC says the surge in internal displacement since January 2022 has brought the total number of displaced people to 5.5 million, and that's the largest caseload in Africa. A brief in the Security Council, Bintu Keita, Special Representative of the Secretary General for the Democratic Republic of Congo, said that armed groups continue to pose a significant threat and commit violence against civilians. According to Keita, most abuses are being perpetrated by the Kodeko, ADF and M23 rebels in Ituri and North Kivu provinces while Mai Mai groups and other militias have intensified attacks on civilians in South Kivu. Armed groups continue to pose a significant threat and commit violence against civilians. Most abusers are being perpetrated by Cooperative for the Development du Congo, CODECO, Allied Democratic Forces, ADF, and the Movement du 23 Mars, M23, in Ituri and North Kivu, while Mai Mai groups and other militias have intensified attacks on civilians in South Kivu. This insecurity fuels human rights violations and has exacerbated an already dire humanitarian situation. An estimated 27 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance, with many having protection needs. A clear indicator of the deteriorating situation is a surge in internal displacement since January 2022, which has brought the total number of displaced people to 5.5 million, the largest caseload in Africa. Still ahead on the program.
The United Nations mission in South Sudan seeks to reduce sexual and gender-based violence by implementing institutional and prison service reforms. Please stay with us for more details. Welcome back to the programme. We continue here in Nigeria, where farmers in Jigawa State, that's northwest of the country, are lamenting their losses as 138,000 hectares of farmlands were destroyed by flood this year. The state government said about 222,000 people have been affected by the floods. Well, our correspondent Sadiq Iliasu has more on the report. In the last two months, 124 persons have died and over 70,000 were displaced as a result of flooding in Jigawa State, Northwest Nigeria. One hundred and thirty-eight thousand hectares of farmlands have been destroyed across the state. Idris Ibrahim is a rice farmer whose farm was completely flooded in Harbour Town, Jahun local government area of the state. He is completely distraught. Another farmer in Gululu, Miga local government area, also laments the situation. Once again, the federal government, through the National Emergency Management Agency, NEMA, hands over relief materials to the Jigao state government for the affected residents. NEMA has come to our aid severally. This is the second time they are delivering this relief to us, and we sincerely thank them very much for this effort, and definitely uh, this will bring a lot of support. The state deputy governor, Uma Ramadi, who receives the items, says the relief materials will go a long way to cushion the effect of the flood. We have intervened in about uh, six or eight local governments before and we had a management meeting and decided that we need to do something like a one-off to all states because we, if we uh, want to do it local government by local government, it will take us a very long time. The flood waters have receded. However, it is hard for people that lost their means of livelihood to move on from this. Sadiq Ilyasu, Channel Television News. Officials in Chad have extended the transition period towards democratic elections and they say they will keep Mohamed Idris Derby as the head of state in the interim. Delegates also agreed for the military leader to be eligible to run for the presidency when elections are held. All these de decisions were made by a National Reconciliation Dialogue Forum which was boycotted by most opposition members. Two out of three key armed rebel groups and civil society organizations. The Chad, one of the world's poorest countries, has endured repeated uprisings and unrest since gaining independence from France in 1960. Tigrayan forces say they have withdrawn from territories in Ethiopia's Amhara region that they had occupied for more than a month amid the ongoing civil war in the north of Ethiopia. In a statement read on regional TV, the Tigrayans said they reconsidered deployments as there was a need to change position to effectively combat the joint force of the Ethiopian Federal Army and its Eritrean ally. In the meantime, the Ethiopian government has not reacted to this of fresh, fresh fighting between Tigray forces and federal troops started at the end of August in northern Ethiopia, ending a five-month truce. Despite growing calls for de-escalation, fighting continues to be reported. The United Nations mission in South Sudan have recently organized a three-day capacity building conference for personnel of South Sudan's National Prison Service on how other UN member states are promoting gender equality and also working to reduce sexual violence and gender-based violence. And it's by implementing institutional and prison service reforms. Well, the workshop was under the theme, gender-friendly prison service for vulnerable groups in prison. ANMIS is supporting gender mainstreaming in the security sector under the broader framework of implementing UNSCR's 1325 and subsequent resolutions on women, peace and security in South Sudan. 
This is a core element of global, regional, national and local efforts to build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels. The prison officers actually are the ones responsible for those uh, category of uh, people that are the lowest. So by um, choosing to train them, actually we will be uh, uh, promoting the issues to do with peace within South Sudan and making the conditions humane for them. It's actually very important that uh, the issues of gender are actually spoken about or this gender is spoken out to the community and it starts from the prison officers themselves around here because they belong to the community and they are handling the most vulnerable people in the society. Despite its efforts, South Sudanese prisons still don't have a sufficient number of women among the employees to be a truly gender-friendly workplace. In this workshop, we have learned a lot. Cooperation of women's rights, or men's right or equality between men and women in the workshop we just had. We learned about how to handle inmates and the way to search female inmates and also how we can encourage them. The workshop, organized for senior managers, aimed at prompting a discussion on how to reach international standards of gender-friendly prison services and the treatment of offenders. Among the priorities and challenges identified were good leadership, accountability, discipline, and respecting all human rights. You are our true partner. Gender affairs in their own miss, child protection, these are our true partners. Because in the prison, we have women. In the prison, we have children. And we call them the vulnerable groups. South Sudan is still facing many obstacles and difficulties in preventing violence, protecting women from abuse, and ensuring women's access to justice. But this workshop was, according to participants, a step in the right direction. Finally on the program, in hopes of boosting local economies and reducing polluting emissions, a company specializing in sustainable transportation recently launched, launched two types of electric motorbikes. That's in Togo and Bene. Kutonu resident Aruna Damasi ignites his new electronic motorbike as he slides silently among the throttling column of motorcycles swarming through rush hour traffic in Benes capital. The 40-year-old informal trader is the proud new owner of an electric two-wheeler made by India-based company M Auto, which launched bikes in Bene and Togo this year. It's an ecological motorcycle, which means it doesn't pollute, it doesn't have smoke. So compared to a petrol motorcycle, you have to agree with me that I am helping in the protection of my environment. When the battery runs low, drivers do not have to stop and recharge, but simply replace it at one of M Auto's 14 swapping stations in Kutanu for 1,000 CFA francs. Emmanuel Ahuendo owns the bigger M Auto model called the Commando. He uses it for deliveries and other jobs. For him and the manufacturers, driving an electric motorcycle is first of all an economical choice. Not only do the regular ones pollute the environment, but are so many parts to change. Every week, every weekend, they have to change the oil. There are small parts to change very frequently, like the chain, and you even have to clean the carburetor sometimes. So this new motorcycle I find to be more economical I only have to change the battery and it starts. We believe in the fact that the electric argument alone is not enough. People have to find an economic benefit. And once they've found that, the ecological arguments will be added. And today, we have customers from all social categories. We have a lot of women who ride our motorcycles, and it's a real pleasure. 
et, et donc aujourd'hui, on a des clients dans toutes les catégories. Wobi drivers are concerned about having to plan routes around battery points rather than filling up from contraband petrol vendors found on almost every street corner. M Auto also has to look into producing longer lasting batteries as typically their scooters run out of power after between 70 and 120 kilometers according to a swapping station employee. Yet M Auto has sold over 2000 e-mopeds since May and aims to make more than 15,000 on East and West African roads by year end. That's it on the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Bye, Olarindi.